this day. We thank you for this Shabbat. Uh, we thank you that we come together uh, as a body, as a community, to, to learn about your ways and to learn about your heart. And uh, we thank you. Uh, we have a, a warm place to, to, to gather. And we just pray, Father, that you'd fill us with your spirit to guide and direct us and to, t to take the nuggets that you have for us to become better servants for you. We ask all these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay, um, we're going to, before we get into this week's Torah portion, which is Vayishalak, and he sent, it's Genesis 32, 4 to 36, uh, through the end of Genesis 36. I want to cover something we didn't cover last week's, in last week's portion and uh, so you're kind of at a disadvantage. You don't have the hand out in front of you, but um, it's it's uh, concerning the term, the phrase, the place. When Jacob had his dream, if you remember um, in Genesis chapter 28, uh, when he s had a dream and he, he saw this ladder that, that reached to heavens. And at the top of the ladder was God and the angels were ascending and descending. Remember the dream? Remember the vision? And um, we kind of touched on some some uh, thematic connections and parallels of this ladder and how it was translated and and um, that same the same uh, vision was seen uh, uh, in uh, Yeshua's day and Yeshua interpreted the, the, the dream or the vision as, as, uh, as the angels ascending and descending upon himself. So the latter kind of represented um, Yeshua. Well, another interesting phrase in Genesis 28, as he tells us about this vision, this dream, is the word, the place. And it's repeated multiple times. Um, if, you, if you turn to your Bible... In Genesis 28, I need a bigger table here, and I just want to point out all the different places because there's a there's an interesting parallel to where this place is and what it represents. Okay, so I just want to make those connections before we get into this week's tour portion because we kind of ran out of time last week. So in Genesis 28, um, in verse 11, it says, And he lighted upon a certain place, and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And uh, then in verse 12, he, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to the heavens, and behold, angels of God ascending and descending. And this, this, this same... These, these same terms about angels ascending and descending on this ladder is the, uh, we saw that same story Yeshua uh, telling about um, uh, when uh, Peter would see, I believe it was Peter, he said the heavens would be opened and he would see, um, was it Peter? I believe, um, help me out here. Uh, come on, we got, a lot of, we got a lot of Bible scholars in here. Um, Stephen, thank you, Stephen. Uh, I knew something was wrong there, and uh, and he asked Stephen, you know, who do the who do the uh, men say that I am? And he said, Thou art the. No, that was Peter. He said, Thou art the uh, the Messiah. And uh, he said, You shall see greater things than these. You shall see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Okay, so. We made that connection. This ladder here, we believe, is a representation of, of Messiah. And uh, so, uh, so we see the term, the place, in verse 11. And then dropping down to 15, um, after uh, the promise is reiterated to Jacob here, that his seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And, uh, and then in verse 15, Behold, I am with thee, and I will keep thee. This is... This is uh, God talking to, to Jacob in his dream. And in all the places, whether now the word places in my version here is in italics, so it's added, but you go on down, it says, Whether thou goest and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave you uh, 
until I have done that which I have spoken to thee. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, I'm in verse 16, Surely Yahweh is in this place. So we see this phrase, this place again. And uh, he says, And I knew it not, verse 17, And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? So the phrase again, this is the third time, right? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate to heaven, okay? Now, just to give you a little hint, he said, this is the house of God. Now, what is that in our minds? What have, what have we read about this house of God? What's another term that we've used for the house of God? Temple, okay. The temple. And, uh, and then in verse 19... And he called the name of that place, so this is the fourth time the term, the place is mentioned, Bethel. But the name of the city was called Luz at first. And Jacob vowed a vow in verse 20, and then dropping down um, in verse 22, he says, and he, oh, well, I should start in 21, so that I, Actually, I should just read 20 through 22 so you get the whole story. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way, that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall Yahweh be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So... Um, so one of the some of the things that uh, uh, Tony Robinson brings out uh, in this term, the place, um, it, occur, it, it, it occurs, I think, like four times. Uh, God's house is mentioned uh, several times in these passages, and um, the, this thematic connection should help shed some light on the meaning of the word, the place. Um, and has this word been used before in a similar manner? So we're going to go back and look at some thematic connections here. Where is this place the Torah hints of we should know about? Now we see that just by using the words of that place, this was in your last week's Torah portion. I don't know if you, if you still have it. You can kind of follow along. Um, the Torah teaches us through thematic connection that that place is none other than the site where Abraham was willing to offer Isaac his only beloved son. So there's a connection now between where Isaac offered his son and this place where Jacob had the dream, okay? All right. Look at the different ways Jacob has characterized the place. He called it Yahweh is present in this place. This place is awesome. This place is the dwelling place of the Holy One. This place is the gate to heaven. Furthermore, he named it Bethel, which means the house of God, uh, the house of Elohim, right? So these are all thematic connections to the place. So what is the significance of these descriptions? Well, the events in the lives of the fathers are prophetic shadows of future events. Biblical, um, biblical events are future prophecies. So they're prophetic shadows of future events in the lives of their descendants. Can you think of a place where it could be said that Yahweh is present, where this place is awesome, where this place is a dwelling place of the Holy One, where this place is a gate to heavens, and this place is the house of Elohim? These instances of the usage of the place are actually prophetic foreshadows of what will happen in this place at the temple. So Jacob being and Jacob being a picture of Israel. So in the book of Deuteronomy, it uses the phrase the place where Yahweh your Elohim will choose to cause his name to dwell numerous times. Right? The phrase uh, the place is translated from the Hebrew word Hamokam. Although Jerusalem is never mentioned by name in the Torah in the first five books, we know that this place prophetically refers to Jerusalem. 
And you can read, uh, if you read Deuteronomy 12, Deuteronomy uh, 16, and Deuteronomy 26 in those chapters, you can see that this place is a very, has a very important theme. And remember the Taurus, especially the book of Genesis, is a shadow of future events. There are many elements of facets missing, how, however, the essential characteristics of the temple are clearly seen in the term, the place. So I just thought that was an interesting, um, some interesting parallels and connections that we didn't get to discuss in la last week's Torah portion, okay? All right, any comments, any questions? This is Open Bible Study. Um, so if you have a comment or question, raise your hand. Uh, we'd like to get you the mic and you can you share your thoughts. Okay, any comments so far on the place? All right. Okay, so let's get into this week's Torah portion. This is uh, Genesis 32, verse 4, to Genesis 36 through 43. Um, now, in this week's uh, Torah portion, there are nine parshas. Now, you remember how many parshas were in last week's Torah portion? One, okay. And we know a, a parsha is, it's like a it's like a sentence or paragraph that has no, no spacings. It's just a continuation, and it's God's way of telling us there's a central theme, you know, in this parsha. So this week, Torah portion, there's nine parshas. So there's there's many themes. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and read. Uh, I'm gonna actually st start in. Uh, verse 1 because uh, so we can get the context here and if you'd like to read raise your hand if we get, you, would you like to read okay okay let's read uh, start in Genesis 32 starting in verse 1 and uh, if you'd like to read uh, half the chapter down to 16 then we'll pick up there and read the rest of the is chapter is this in this right here uh no oh, okay well i didn't bring the bible okay okay i'll okay i'll go ahead and start reading if you'd like to read after me just we're going to get through chapters 32 and 33 and jacob went on his way in verse one and the angels of god met him boy the angels have been pretty busy you know meeting with jacob haven't they and when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host, and he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Mahanaim? And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you speak unto my lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban, and stayed there until now. And I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I might, that I might find grace in thy sight. Now one thing I want to kind of point out here is notice how many times Jacob refers to Esau as my Lord. And how many times Jacob refers to himself as the servant to his brother Esau. Okay, now we learned in uh, chapters in the prior chapters here that who was prophesied to serve who when Esau and Jacob were born all right so it's interesting here in this chapter now how many times Jacob is to kind of taken a reverse role here from what he was prophesied to do and what he deceived you know his 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 uh, father into giving him okay it's, so this is an interesting twist here okay so just notice how many times he calls Esau his lord and he refers to him, him as uh, Esau's servant okay verse 6 and the messengers returned to Jacob saying we came to thy brother Esau and also he cometh to meet thee and 400 men with him then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with them, and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two bands, and said, If Esau come the, the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. 
So this is Jacob's first response after hearing that Esau was not alone. He had 400 men, okay? And usually when somebody, the term 400 men comes into play, they're not just um, farmers. That's, yeah, <laughs> herdsmen. They are ready for war, okay, prepared. Because remember when Abraham went to get Lot, he took 300 of his trained servants, um, you know, to go and take back Lot. So, so Jacob is trembling in his shoes now. And uh, so he, he comes up with this plan. I'm going to separate all of us into two groups, okay? So if he smites the one, at least one group gets away, right? And then Jacob said, so now what does he do? He's afraid. He, he starts with his plan. He separates into two companies, and now that's the first thing he does. What's the second thing he does? He begins to cry out to pray. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, Yahweh which said unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. So he's reminding Yahweh that, hey, you send me, you're sending me back to the land of Canaan. I'm going to run into my brother Esau, so you said that you would deal well with me. I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercies. So now he's kind of in a, I'm sorry for all the things I've done, okay, and I don't deserve this. So his, his heart is in the right place at this moment. I am not worthy of all the least of your mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children." And thou said, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. And he lodged there that same night, and he took of that which came to his hand a present for Esau, his brother. So first thing he did, he split the camp in two groups. Second thing, he prayed. The third thing, now he's, he's preparing gifts, okay? For Esau. 200 she goats, 20 he goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milk camels with their colts, 40 kine, 10 bulls, 20 she asses, and 10 foals. And he delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by themselves. And he said unto his servants, Pass over before me and put a space between drove and drove and he commanded the foremost saying when he saw my brother sees you and asks thee saying what art thou and whither goest thou and whose art these before thee then you shall say they be thy servants Jacob so here he says again they are your servants Jacob's it is a present sent unto my lord Esau and behold also he is behind us and so commanded he the second and the third and all that followed the drove, saying, On this manner shall ye speak unto Esau when ye find him. And say ye moreover, Behold, the servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goeth before me, and afterward I will see his face. Peradventure he will accept me. So went the present over before him, and himself lodged that night in the company. And he rose up that night and took two wives and two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over all that he had. Now at this point, remember he made two camps, right? He split them up. Well, it seems like there's a change of plans now here. So when he... Um, he got up that night after he prayed, or he, and uh, uh, then he put together this, all these droves, these presents to Esau. Then he gets up and, uh, in the night, and uh, 
he gathered together with his the company, the whole company. And he rose up. He took his two wives, his two women servant, or women servants, and his eleven sons, and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them, and sent them over the brook, and sent them, sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and there he wrestled, a man with him until the breaking of day. And when he saw that he had prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except you bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God, and with men, and has prevailed. And Jacob asked him, and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Penel, for I have seen the God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. Chapter 33. Does anybody else want to read? Thank you. I didn't know. I knew I knew it was a part of the uh, uh, part of the, yeah. And <laughs> chapter 33 and Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked and behold Esau came and with him 400 men. And so he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids and he put the handmaids and their children foremost and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hinder most. So, so remember, first he had them divided up into two camps. Now he's got a different setup. So something changed, you know, in Esau's heart here. You know, he went from fearing that Esau's coming to slay me. Okay. And now he seems to be, um, well, maybe in his prayers he was praying to God, reminding of what God promised him, that, well, maybe I need to rely a little bit more on what God promised me. And maybe Esau will be forgiving because 20 years ago Esau was ready to kill him. And es and uh, But we see Jacob has kind of a change of heart. Instead of taking, deceiving, now he's prepared this huge, these huge droves of gifts to Esau, okay? And it's interesting, at this point, his name was changed from Jacob to Israel, which has another important spiritual application. And, um, and it's in the portion, but I'm just going to go ahead and, and kind of give it to you now. As, you know... As God's people, we know that in the flesh that we can do nothing, you know, um, you know, good enough for God. We we have to rely on on, on God's spirit, and uh, so, you know, when we Jacob was pursuing life, you know, in his way, you know, doing things in his own strength. Things did not work out so well. Now, he's, there seems to be a change of heart. And instead of being, you know, he was told that he was going to be a ruler, okay, and then as the older shall serve the younger. Um, now, he's taken this, this, this attitude, you know, toward his brother Esau that, you know, hey, my Lord, he called him Lord many times. He, he said, I'm your servant. So it's at that point his name was changed to Israel. You know, Israel was supposed to be a what to the nation, a light to the nations. 
And it was when God's people, you know, connected with God and took on a spirit. Now they became a people to serve. Before that, you know, men tend to serve themselves. So you see the connection here between, you know, um, Jacob realizing that, you know, doing things in his own strength wasn't working out well. He's getting ready to meet Esau. He has a change of heart. Um, and he decides to be a, a leader, a servant leader, rather than, you know, a leader just to serve himself. And uh, he prepares this, 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 you know, the, these gifts to give Esau. And he just had, and at that point, God changes his name to Israel. So I think it's a, it's a spiritual lesson here that when we do things God's ways and we take on his spirit, that at that point we can become like Israel was supposed to be, a light to the nations. We can be a, a light to our communities. When we take on, we lead, but we lead with a servant's heart, a servant's mindset. Does that make sense? Okay, so continuing on in chapter 33. So, um, so he takes his, his family, his wives, and he splits them up. Um, putting Rachel last, Leah second, and uh, and him first. In verse 3, and he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near his brother. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Es Jacob was expecting his brother to, you know, to come to murder he had a change of heart. And how did Esau respond to that change of heart? You see what happens when we allow God to, um, you know, work in our lives the way he wants to work in our lives. And, and we do things his way. It changes. I mean, first our heart has to change, but it has a positive effect on those that we, that we are around. And so Esau had a change of heart because he saw a change of heart in Jacob. And uh, so I thought this is, a, this is an interesting story here. And uh, he lifted up his eyes and he saw the women and the children, I'm in verse 5, and said, Who are those with thee? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. So he keeps referring to himself as the servant. And isn't that what we're supposed to be? Who shall be the greatest in the kingdom? You know, but he that you know that, but he that serves, right? Then the handmaids came near they and their children, and they bowed themselves. So not only is you know did Jacob have a change of heart, and he's learning how to become a servant now. You know, his children, you know, and and those with him, his servants. Are acting likewise. Then the handmaids came near, and they and their children, they bowed themselves. Verse 7, And Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves. And after came Joseph near and Rachel, and they bowed themselves. Well, there's a lot of bowing going on here. To a man who was told that his brother would bow to him. And he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? And he said, There are to find, these are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. <laughs> and Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that which thou hast unto thyself. And Jacob said, No, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present in my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God, and thou wast pleased with me. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and he took it. And he said, Let us take our journey, and let us go, and I will go before thee. And he said unto him, My Lord knoweth that the children are tender, and the flocks and the herds with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly according as the cattle 
that goeth before me, and the children to be able to endure until I come to my Lord in Seir. And Esau said, Let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me. And he said, What needeth it? Let me find grace in thy sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, and Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth, and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkoth. So it's interesting. You know, Jacob leaves Laban, who kind of took advantage of him for 20 years. You know, a type of, of uh, the same journey that uh, Israel you know, um, coming out of Egypt under the servitude of under the hand of Pharaoh. We see something similar where Jacob leaves Laban, right? He crosses the river, and he goes to a place called Sukkoth. And what does he do? He builds Sukkoths. He builds booths. Interesting parallel to the story. This is well before they went down into Egypt, Okay, so these, these, these stories, these events are biblical prophecies of what's going to happen to the, their descendants, their children, later on. And Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padaran, Padanaram, and pitched his tent before the city, and he brought a parcel or bought a parcel of field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamar, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar and called it Elial Lo He Israel. Okay, so interesting turn of events. Some comments, some questions we got. Kevin. I just recall that this land that he purchased for to, in today's Israel, there's three places that the Bible records that Israel actually purchased. But today, those are the three places that the Palestinians have that the Israelites actually don't have. So the argument of Israel was never there, they found was interesting that the three places in the Bible that were purchased would be evidence that they did have some of that land before. And I just thought I'd share that little bit of comment. I don't know if you knew that or not. No, I did. Thank you. Another comment. Got some more. Uh, a couple things I see here is uh, looks like Jacob. Years ago when I read this, and every time I read this, I think about Jacob trying to butter up Esau until he don't kill him, okay? Sending all these flocks and the way he did everything. That's, that's just what I'm seeing here. But he calls himself a servant which I find real interesting when if he has a change of heart, is he really a servant? He's not really a servant for Esau, is he a servant for Yahweh? Is that what he's, is that where he went? Is he now a servant for Yahweh, which I believe he is. Also, the biggest thing I see in this whole uh, piece of history here that I get out of it, probably nobody else will, but it's really important that I think that Jacob told Esau, after all this went down, they were loving on each other and kissing and hugging each other. He said, look, Esau says, come on, let's go. I'll go with you. No. Jacob said, no, I'm, I'm only going to go as fast as my slowest link, so to speak. He loved what he had. And the slowest link, if I'm not mistaken here, is, is uh, wasn't it uh, milking or wasn't it some type of an animal? Didn't he say it was an animal? Did anybody see it? It's a, hang on. Was it cattle? Okay. So the slowest link was, was a cattle. But I believe that that's a big important lesson for us we need to go in our lives and take care of the slowest link in our family and bring them up uh, and go slow with them with the rest of the family until we all are kind of on the same page that's just personal opinion that's what I'm seeing I me and another guy read this years ago at work and and we were laughing about how he oh he's buttering up Esau look at this he's sending these flocks I mean it was pretty neat okay I'm done thanks <laughs> Yoking on. Yeah, um, I, I see this part of this section you just read to kind of differently. Um, I, he's definitely, I agree, you know, 
buttering up to him, but I think his constant usage of term to call himself servant is is just more of that mindset at the moment. You know, his appeasement. You know, I I think it's definitely beginning to change. You know, since he wrestled the angel and and his name was changed. I think it's like a crossover showing he's starting to mature. But I I, I see his call himself the servant more of appeasement. You know. Uh, just al along the same lines is why he's given all these gifts to him, and and I remember right he, he's he wants to take the slower path because he doesn't want to go to Sierra. And he actually is <laughs> deceiving his brother again. <laughs> is I think that's what we read after this part. He he didn't go to Sierra. He went off in some other direction. So mm -hmm. I think. Um, you know, he was, even though he was trying to make up with his brother for sure, he was, uh, he was just deceiving him because he was so fearful of him. And uh, and he did end up going off, you know, I don't remember what town he went to next after Sukkot, but. Yeah, he, uh, well, it, he, his motivation, you know, he was, he feared for his life, and you're right. He was uh, wondering, you know, um, what can I do? to gain my brother's, you know, <coughs> forgiveness. And we've all done it when we've had arguments, you know, with our spouses or, um, you know, with somebody. And so what what have we done? How have we tried to reconcile? Have we ever used uh, gifts or presents to, to try to reconcile? Have you ever sent your wife flowers when after an argument? Um, nope. <laughs> Yeah, um, but you know, one of the things is that sometimes when the motivation, or, you know, the the original motivation isn't right. Um, once we realize the fruit that it produced from following through, if we don't have a change of heart, then you know it's going to come back on us, and uh, so. It definitely affected Esau in his response to Jacob, and uh, one of the, I think one of the reasons why, um, you know, he if if you've if you've studied the uh, uh, the life of Esau and, and what he represents, um, some of you have heard me use the term the Hyksos, um, and uh, you know dis uh, descendants of Esau where they try to, um, you know, to infiltrate, become part of the community so they can begin to overtake and destroy, you know, from the inside. Um, and I think Jacob knew that, you know. I, and uh, so he was not interested in, in, in joining league with Esau, you know, moving forward. He wanted to reconcile and move on and be separate. But it's interesting, Esau wanted to leave some of his company with Jacob. And that's, you know, that's how the Hyksos operate. And, um, and typically not a good thing. Okay. Um, Lance. Um, I see a lot of prophecy here reaching into the last days. Yeah. One of them being that Benjamin did not bow down to Esau. He wasn't even alive. I think that's huge. You didn't want to expand any further? I, I don't know much more than that. Besides that. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, when Jacob wrestled, with the angel, was it possible that he was wrestling with the fact that he wanted to flee yes. instead of uh, being there in the position that God wanted him to be? So he was physically wrestling with it. And uh, I, I mean, and then the whole adage that says if you wrestle, he'll, he changes your walk. I mean, that's where we get that. It's, you know, he physically changed Jacob's walk, but I think he physically changed his ours too. 
Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, one of the things that's covered in your handout here, you know, when, when uh, Jacob seemed to have a change of heart and he changed up his plans, you know, with the way he arranged um, his, his company, um, could it be that, that, that he was ready, at one point he was ready to flee? Early on in the, you know, when uh, he was, re yeah, so he had, you know, we've all, we've all been there, you know, do we go, do we, do we fight, do we run, do we fight, and um, could it be that, that when he wrestled with God, and God affected his, you know, his hip, that it prevented him from fleeing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Because that would have really slowed him up, right? So that wasn't so. So now he's in a position where, okay, you know, my plan B, what I want to do is just run and not deal with reconciliation. Which have we been there before? You know, we 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 want to run and we don't want to deal with reconciliation. It's easier sometimes that way. But is that that's that's it just prolongs it. And so it, could it be that the angel wrestled with Jacob, affected his ability to flee, and made him face his brother? So another interesting point. Brian? Okay, one, one last, you know, we're looking at the human part of it too, and a lot of spiritual, but the, on the spiritual level. So when Jacob was born, and I believe that Esau was trying to stomp his head in because he was holding his, Jacob was blocking the hill. I don't believe that this was, I know it sounds kind of crazy, but I believe it was good and evil. And, and, and Jacob, being the manipulator that he kind of was all through his life, kind of off and on, you know, when he did wrestle this Elohim, I believe is what it's actually called, and he did have a change of heart at this point in time. And I believe that Elohim give him protection because I think Jacob was walking into an evil situation. And I believe that Elohim after he had a change of heart, protected him like he's going to protect us. Mm -hmm. I actually think this goes along with today. Mm -hmm. We're going to be protected, okay, because we have a, we have, we've had our hearts changed to follow him. And, and I still believe that if he would not have had that heart change that Esau, that would have been evil. But Yahweh had a plan. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that he was going to keep the evil one from, from reigning. And I still believe that to, in my heart today. Yeah. Now, Tony goes on to say that, you know, even though Esau may have forgiven him, his descendants didn't. You know, they, they were a thorn in, in Jacob's side. And it was prophesied that they would be a thorn in their side. Okay. And, uh, but it did, did a, a, appease him for, you know, at least the one generation. Another comment? I don't know. Right, right, yeah, 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 yeah. And there's, if you read, if you read the rest of this, um, there's examples of, of what happens when the people mingled with, the the, the other nations, the pagan nations, um, when Israel was was uh, on their journey, and uh, they made league with uh, some of them made league with the the Moabites. And uh, began to take their wives, and uh, um, a plague came through the camp. And if remember, Phineas stood up. They were weeping at the t at the tent of meeting, and because of this 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 abomination, and um, Phineas looked up and he saw this 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 uh, this man with this uh, Moabite woman, or many I can't remember taking her into into his tent, and he. Um, you know, and his zeal took his javelin. And, and if you understand the life of Phineas, he was uh, given the role of the temple guard, you know, to protect the sanctity of the, of the um, you know, the, 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 the tabernacle and the, and the different levels of holiness. And he saw that, and in his zeal, he went and he struck them through. And, um, he, and his, his, his zeal wasn't in the fact of killing somebody because they did a wrong. His zeal was to stay the plague so the rest of Israel wouldn't be, wouldn't succumb to the plague. You know, so in essence, he saved many lives 
by taking, you know, the life of those two. And uh, so there was that example. And then, then further on in their journey, they were they uh, decided to league up with. Uh, well, Yahweh told them to war against the Midianites because of um, he didn't want them to, you know, to to intermarry. And and uh, so um, they destroyed all the men of the Midianites and they took their spoil. You know, took their wives and their children, which. If we would have got into the next chapter in the Porsche there, chapter 34, that's where, you remember Dinah, she goes off and she decides to, to explore the world and she runs into Shechem and, uh, you know, they have her, uh, he forces her and, and uh, it upsets the, the brothers of Dinah and uh, so they make a league with them and we'll, we'll marry your daughters and you give us your daughters and and uh, they said, well, we'll only come into league with you if, you if all your males get circumcised. And then three days into that, Simeon and Reuben went in and destroyed them all. And uh, so there's just so many parallels of, the, of, of those stories of not, you know, not uh, joining in league with, uh, you know, with, with, with pagan nations and peoples because it, um, it's, it's, not good for the, it's not good for the body. I think we got another comment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Those are great comments uh, because that is the tree of the knowledge of good with evil. Not good or evil, but good with evil. And that doesn't work. But um, So it, there's so many ways to interpret this entire portion of Torah. But And it's very confusing, and there's so many things that it's easy to say, well, that seems good or that seems bad. But the bottom line is, and I think the lesson that comes from it, is there is what's Caesar's, there's what's God's. Jacob didn't pray to Esau. He prayed to his God. He didn't worship Esau. He prayed to his God. He honored Esau in a manner that was worldly, and it simply respected the position that Esau had earned in the world without disrespecting God. But the moral of the story comes down to the fact that the fruit of things that happen should be our indication of whether it was right or wrong. And the fruit of this entire event, starting with the blessing, was that Jerusalem was founded for a hundred pieces of money after this event. That's Shalem is Jerusalem, that's Jerusalem. That was Israel was formed as a name and it was formed as a nation right then and there. That was the fruit that's how we need to judge it because of the fruit of it in my opinion okay well thank you for all your input it was uh, a, a very interesting parsha very interesting tour portion we only got through part of it but uh some of you i i last week uh didn't get a copy of last week's and i think there's three of you i think mary was one of them i printed them off so make sure i get them to you and uh, from last week. And so at this time, we'll take a quick break. And uh, when you hear the shofar blast, we'll resume the next part of the service. Thank you.